Welcome to What Are You Sporting About podcast, a podcast about business, employment, sports, and entertainment to help educate, support, and guide you to your next level. Here's your host, attorney Savania DeBarros. Hello, hello, everybody. I am Savanya DeBarros, protector of athletes, also the founding and principal attorney of the SL DeBarros Law Firm, where I represent athletes, business owners, and high-achieving employees. Today, I have Dr. Sarah Leppi. Let's make sure that is right, because let me tell you one thing. This is Women's History Month. OK, and as many times as Sarah knows, as I have spoken to her so often, I didn't even think to repronounce your last name. <laughs> no worries. And you know what? Everybody gets it wrong. There really should be an accent on the last E. Um, but I think that got lost a, a few years go. back with my husband's family. But it's uh, <laughs> Dr. Sarah Lepe. <laughs> Lepe. Lepe. Yeah. Yes, you need an accent because I would have completely known. So one reason why I wanted to stop and get that correct is because we know that women and especially at women who are of a different race and culture, culture are more marginalized. So I don't want to contribute to that by failing to properly represent, not represent, but pronounce your name. So Dr. Sarah Lepe is here with us today, guys, and I want to give you a small introduction to her because she is absolutely phenomenal. And like I said, I've had an opportunity to connect and talk with her before, which is one of the reasons why I invited her on to this podcast. So, you know, I always want to bring people um, who are making major moves in their own industry, in their own way to create an impact that they know will support and help other people to move forward in the next part of their lives and or business. So Dr. Lepe, she's also known as Coach Sarah. She's a former Division I volleyball player and founder of the Rebranded Athlete, where she helps athletes transition out of sports. She also authored the book, Pivoting from the Game, so make sure you go and check that out. She completed her doctorate in education with an emphasis in transformational leadership from Concordia University. So with over a decade of educational leadership experience, being in a classroom as a teacher and a school site administrator, she has helped to build strong school culture and community, which is amazing, guys. So athletics did absolutely play a tremendous role throughout her life and especially in pursuing her career goals. But after the final whistle of her last game, little did she know there would be a challenge to transition out of athletics and pursue her career. She is definitely passionate about helping athletes understand their potential and drive them towards their purpose as they make the transition out of athletics and become change leaders in the world. So thank you so much for joining me for today's podcast. And is there anything that you'd like to add um, to your background just so that viewers can get to know Sarah a little bit more, Dr. Sarah a little bit more? Wow, I think that was definitely a great introduction. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I appreciate being here in our connection, um, you know, that we've made over the last, you know, few months or whatnot. But um, no, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with it. And I'm sure as we go along um, with the podcast today, people are going to learn a little bit more about me um, and, the, and exactly what the work the work is that I do and really why I left education to pursue this work. So I'm excited to get started for today. Yeah, so let's jump it off right now. I want to know what are you sporting about? I feel like part of it is definitely going to be in alignment with what you just said. But tell everybody, what is Dr. Leppy sporting about? Yeah, you, you know, oh, no worries. You'll get it right. By the end of this episode, I'll quiz you. <laughs> um, but really for me, uh, you know, like my bio states is really helping athletes find their place in the world is what I'm all about. Being a D1 athlete myself, even though I had a plan, I was going to go and be a teacher and then, you know, figure out life from there. I knew what was happening, but I wasn't prepared for the loss of my sport that I was going to face. And I really didn't know that I had such a huge identity attached to Sarah, the volleyball player. And who was I going to be without that sport anymore? Um, and I really had to find my place in the world and kind of figure out 
you know, who I was and where I was supposed to be. So I'm really passionate about not only helping athletes figure out what's next, but also how they can become the change leaders in this world. Because I believe that athletes have the ability to change the world. We just have to get them in the right place where they need to be in the next season of their life. Yes, love all of that. And also recognize the innate power that they have on the inside of them that is unique to each and every person. I mean, if you look at major events that happen between different centuries, a lot of times there's always athletes who are stepping up to the plate demanding change in those those areas. But sometimes when it's easy to demand change for other people, we forget that we need to take up space and demand it for ourselves. So hint, your struggle on transitioning, um, knowing that a change was imminent, knowing that you had to, there was no other option <laughs> but to transition, like what helped you to finally make that realization to finally step out and garner up the confidence, the power, um, whatever tools that it was that you needed to move from out of the athletics, out, remove the one sided identity of what you what you had as a volleyball athlete and now move into a space where you are you were and are fully equipped to occupy. Well, first of all, first off, I had a really rude awakening um, as I finished up school. So I was a fifth year senior. Um, I blew out my knee my freshman year playing volleyball. So I was one of those super seniors by the time I graduated. So that last semester, I started to really have that disconnect um, within myself as the volleyball player and what was next. And I really didn't focus on academics as much as I should have. Um, I ended up getting a C minus in one of my classes, which really isn't a big deal. But um, when it comes to your major coursework, it's equivalent to a D. And so when I moved home, the plan was to go to the teaching credential program and to figure out my way from there. I go to the mailbox expecting to pick up my transcript out of the mail. And in fact, there was this letter and I still remember it to this day as bright yellow. And it said, you know, we're sorry to inform you, but your degree has not been conferred. So that really shook me to the core. Um, first of all, I was already a year later out of school than what I had anticipated. So all, the, all, my, all of my friends that had gone to high school, they were already getting into grad school. Some of them were getting married already. Like life was already happening for them. And I was still in this jersey and, you know, uh, finishing, finishing up college, which I thought I had finished. So that kind of landed me where I had to make a decision for myself as far as, you know, I could willow in the sorrow of it or I could figure out something else and move forward. And so in the meanwhile, um, and my mom to this day still remembers the conversation I had with her. I was just so flustered. I was like, you know what? Forget this. I'm going to bartending school. <laughs> so little fact about me, I was actually a bartender for 10 years um, in the process of becoming myself. And so I did that for a, a year until I was able to get into the teaching credential program, held that job at the same time. And, and what I really found when I finally got my foot into the workforce, because I really didn't have much work experience being a full time D1 athlete. There's just not enough time for that, except the summertime where you're, when you're trying to make a little bit of cash here and there. Um, but what I found very quickly was that I was different and I was different because not only because I was a tall girl that was working there and looked a little bit athletic, but because I brought a different set of work ethic with me. I was the problem solver. I was, even if it was just, you know, a bartending job where I was also a waitress, I was efficient with what I was doing. I was trying to create that team-like environment even when I was there and like all these things didn't really stick out to me until later on when I got into teaching where it was like, wow, okay, I was different even in my job as a bartender. And then I saw it as a teacher too, even though I was new my first year, I said I was going to sit back, you know, kind of observe things and see where I could step up into maybe being a leader on campus, you know, even if it was a lead teacher or whatnot. And I found out very quickly too, that there were some people that were there that were simply there to do their job and they went home and they wanted nothing more to do with it. And then there were other people who were like me who wanted more and they wanted to provide more for the kids, more opportunities for growth, all that type of thing. And so 
that's kind of what really set me off on the path of, okay, here's something that I know I can be good at. I was always a leader on the court. I was a team captain for over 10 years. So I had a lot of experience that way. And that's when the connection really started, started to hit me that I already have this experience. And I think that's what we tell athletes is like, we don't, you don't have any work experience. You know, you got to start from ground zero in the workforce, which in reality, we've learned so many lessons, life lessons that we have had on the court, the field, the pool, wherever we're at. And if we can find a way to transfer that over into the workforce, how much more better and efficient can we be with the jobs that we're doing and be those leaders that we want to be? So that's kind of where that journey started for me. I came from a background of educators. My my dad was a principal. My aunt was one too. So, you know, it's the, no no coincidence that I ended up being a principal as well. But it wasn't without people, you know, telling me and showing me that, you know, I have these leadership type skills. I've always been a leader. And all I had to do was simply apply what I did as an athlete to what I did in the workforce. And that's how I saw success very early on. And I was considered to be a young principal. I really, I worked my way up the ranks very quickly. And it took me six years to finally get a teaching position because at the time the recession was happening, all these different things. And so that also went back to my athlete mentality as well, because, you know, when you face adversity, how you can overcome that and not give up on your goal. And I finally got there. And when I got there, I, I still even remember the first week I was like, how can I figure out how to become a leader? You know, and so within five years, I became an assistant principal. I was there for three years before I decided to jump into being a principal. And the cool part about that story is I ended up being a principal at the same school site that my dad was a principal and also my aunt, too. So you talk about kind of family legacy, not not even meaning to it, just all the cards, you know, laid the way that they were supposed to be for, for me to have that position. Yeah, <laughs> man, that's amazing. And I'm so glad that you went into the waitressing job and the lessons that it it taught you, because that was something I was going to ask you anyway. Um, you know, sometimes when things look like they are falling down around us, I like to always say that God is he, not necessarily that you're failing, but he's setting you up for your comeback. And so when it doesn't feel good or we haven't achieved the things that we thought we set out to do, sometimes that diversion is taking you on a different path so that you can actually walk into the greatness or the role that you're meant to be in to serve and do the best good. So I'm so glad that you were able to reflect on that prior work experience because there's so many different people who would have been put in that same position. And the only thing they would have to say about it would be negative thoughts, you know, grunting about the fact that, okay, this is just the way life is and I'm giving up, <laughs> you know, there's nothing else worth living for. Um, you know, why would this happen to me? But it was really an aha moment for you and showed you not only did that position illustrate leadership and team working skills, but it also shined a light, I feel, on the experience you had as an athlete. So now, and, and this is so cool too, what you said about your family. I mean, literally a by, what assistant principal and principal at the exact same school that your dad and your aunt was at. I mean, that is just not a coincidence. That's when you know that things are falling around for your betterment. They're falling down for your betterment, right? Um, but it's also falling together. Everything is coming and being put into place for your good. Um, so I want to, I do want to ask you a little bit about that piece of getting that document in the mail, recognizing that they couldn't confirm your degree, and then it took you on this entire diversion. Would you have changed anything about that process now looking back on it? Ooh, that's such a great question. You know, um, I, I, I'm a firm believer that things happen for a reason, even if we don't 
understand it in the moment. And even jumping back a little bit to my freshman year when I talked about I got injured, I was actually, I went into Fullerton declaring as a kinesiology major because I wanted to be an athletic trainer and I, you know, wanted to still be around sports. But that year taught me, um, I didn't want to do that because I spent so much time in the training room and I saw what the job really entailed. And I'm like, you know what, this really isn't where I'm supposed to be. So my plan B was education. So had that not happened to me, um, that injury, I don't know if my life would have been different, but that was the, the cards that I was dealt at the time, you know, and the same thing moving into, where I received that letter. Um, I believe everything happens for a reason and for whatever reason it was. Um, and, you know, now that I know <laughs> it's really developing into the leader that I became, I needed that hard lesson early on. And I think that really kind of set me up and set the course for success because I had to I had to realize early on in my transition, because as an athlete, we have all these resources, we have all these different things, you know, that help us along the way. And as soon as we're done with our sport, we're on our own. And what that really taught me in that moment is that if I'm going to make it, I'm going to have to do this on my on my own and figure things out. And at that time, there was no such thing as athlete transition like this. Uh, these were not conversations that were being had. It was literally here's your jersey on your senior night. You know, thank you for your service. You're on your way. And then the time when I needed a coach the most, I didn't have one. I had a coach my whole life up until my transition. And although I had a very supportive family, it's just different because they don't know what you're feeling and what you're going through because they haven't been through it themselves. Um, I do have one family member who played basketball in college, my aunt. Um, and she was always, she's actually the one that got me started with volleyball. And so, you know, she's the one I have a lot of conversations about. And I did during that time as well, cause she got it, you know, she knew what that was like, but for people that don't understand, it can be a very hard transition, um, trying to figure out not only what's next, but who you are, you know, that identity piece is huge um, moving forward. So to answer your question, I don't think I would change anything because it made me who I am today, you know, and I think that there are roadblocks along the way in our life because we're being tested with the skill set that we've attained so that we know whether or not, you know, we need to refine things and move forward, or maybe we needed to pivot in a different direction. And I think what I've really learned through this experience too, is that you're not just going to pivot once as an athlete, you know, you're going to continue. Life is full of transitions. So your, your boot camp is your transition out of athletics and you better be prepared for other times in your life that you're going to transition, but you're going to go back to what you learned during that time and apply those skills to every time you have a change in your life. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder why it's so hard for athletes to transition because when you think about whatever your sport may be, there are multiple times in your sport, whether it's through your training, weightlifting, um, I was a track runner. So, you know, the way that you ran over a hurdle, like your technique was huge. And every time you had to keep transitioning to perfect what it was that you were doing so that you can try your best to be the best at your craft. Um, and a lot of that does have a, a mental component attached to it too, because you have to encourage yourself each and every time. Yeah. There may be a coach here or there. There may be you know, um, a teammate on the side cheering you on from time to time. But when you get in and you start running your race by yourself or having to uh, manhandle whatever your position is by yourself, you have to encourage yourself. There's a old God, well, I can't say it's super old, but there's a gospel song that says sometimes you have to encourage yourself. And when I get to the point, like I'm so down, I start singing that song because I can I can get myself where I need to be. It may not look pretty right now. It may not be the desired place in my life right now, but I still have the wherewithal and the power to self-motivate and self-encourage me. And so whatever transition that needs to take place, and here's another thing too. I feel like we need to stop thinking about transitioning as this one 
dynamic thing that only happens once in a lifetime because there's so many different ways that we're transitioning throughout our life, throughout our day. I mean, if you think about reorganizing your calendar, your schedule, um, if you are a person who had to coordinate your class time with your workout time, with your team travel and competition dates, you were transition. You were in the midst of transitioning certain things. Like you're working your mind. You're also working your body physically. You're also worrying about what your technique is that you're gonna use. And if you are anything like me, because I was also a competitive cheerleader, you're probably also thinking about this stuff in your sleep. <laughs> so I think I think maybe we we psych ourselves out a little much by giving too much or putting too much emphasis on the word of, you know, transitioning or lack of transitioning um, when all it is, is really thinking about who we are as individuals and what our real strengths are. Not what other people said we need to have or that they think we don't have, but really figuring out who we are and what makes us, us. So with that, because there's a lot that you you unpacked for me. Um, resilience is something that I'm super passionate about. It's something I also talk on. I want to know how all of these things throughout your life that you've experienced, how has it helped you to build a resilience muscle? And do you pull those tools out of your toolbox from time to time to help you keep you know, moving forward to help other athletes in this transitional phase? You know, I've always loved the underdog mentality, and that's what I've always been about since day one. Um, even going into high school, it was one of those things where um, I went to Oxnard High School here in California. And at the time, uh, the, the program was bottom of the conference. It was a very competitive conference. And by the time um, I was a sophomore on varsity, sophomore, junior, senior year, we'd won the championship every year just because we had that grit, that underdog mentality. And so when I was being recruited to different schools, I had, you know, I was very fortunate and blessed that I did have a, a plethora of different schools that I could choose from, um, you know, big, big time schools, even Hawaii, you know, Texas, Pacific, um, University of uh, UC Irvine, all kinds of different schools were looking at me, but I chose Cal State Fullerton because I wanted that underdog experience. I didn't want to go in some place, you know, knowing that, you know, I'm going to be guaranteed a ring because that's like the dynasty that was there. I've always seen, you know, the potential in, in different things, whether it's within athletics or even in my time being the bartender or being the uh, school site principal, I was actually recruited as an, uh, uh, as an assistant principal to come into a school site and help turn it around just because that's kind of like my thing. I've always been about bringing community and I was never the type of leader that was top down where it was like, I'm the boss. You guys are below me. You know, you would find me as a principal. I would be outside sweeping, mopping, directing traffic, like whatever it took. And that's that's like the team aspect that I always love to bring within my team. And everybody just enjoyed what they did and everybody worked together. And so kind of going into, you know, the resiliency part, there were different you know, things that had happened in the course of my career that made me have to really apply that underdog mentality. Even for me going into being a principal, although, you know, from the story we've heard already from me, it sounds picture perfect, right? Like, yes, yeah, she, you know, she went from being that teacher to assistant principal to principal and oh, how great she was at the same school site that her family was at. But what people didn't see was behind the scenes of what I had to do in order to get there. First of all, like I'd mentioned, it took me six years to get my own classroom. I had my degree, I had a master's degree, and I had a teaching credential, but there were no jobs to be found. Once I finally did get my classroom, it was only on a temporary contract because they were letting teachers go left and right. That's why I kept that bartending job for so long. And so when I finally got into being an assistant principal, um, 
I, I was denied a few times. And so just to kind of paint the picture for you guys, I worked in the same district that my aunt and my dad worked at. And at the time, my dad was on the board, board of trustees. And so there's obviously conflict of interest when they're trying to hire or if they're trying to promote somebody. And so it took me a couple of times to finally make it to that final interview as an assistant principal. And I did. And there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of political drama that went on just because my dad was principal, even though he recused, recused himself from the meeting. Um, it was still one of those things where, you know, people wondered why I got the job over other people because I didn't have that much experience. So I always had that thing against me that I was too young and I didn't have enough experience. Although I had been a leader, you know, for over a decade, I had all this experience as an athlete. I had all these different things. I had to continue to prove myself each and every year. And so as you can imagine, when I was moving on to be principal, um, and I, you know, I was the final candidate, but there were still, there were still people who were, were um, not in favor of it just because, of my family and them thinking that this is, you know, just something that's happening, basically like nepotism, <laughs> you know? And so that really built resilience in me and it, and it, it allowed me to just, you know, even though you have, when you're performing as an athlete, you have those hecklers, you have those naysayers, you narrow in and focus in on what your goal is and why you're doing it. I didn't want this job because I wanted a bigger pay rate. I wanted this job because I wanted to go in and make a difference and make an impact for the children and the families that I was serving. So when you have that why in front of you, I think that resiliency part really pops out because it allows you to do things and push yourself in different ways to be creative, to find ways to you know, solve problems and solutions and really see the bigger picture besides yourself. So it really wasn't about me. It was about me getting to that point so that I could help and serve. And I was very proud of the school site that I was at, even though, though it was a very short time for three years, I helped them to grow into a K-8 school. They had been a K-5 school for um, about 15 years and they grew up to being a K-8 school and I was able to help start that. And so you talk about that resiliency piece, you know, there were there were times where I, I could have easily just said, you know what, forget this. I'm having to work, you know, twice as hard as everybody else just to prove myself to get the same paycheck as everybody else. But I didn't want that. I wanted to, you know, really prove to everybody what I was all about. And that's kind of where, you know, the aspect of rebranded athlete was born as well, too, because I saw how hard I was working to have to prove myself along the way. And I know I wasn't alone. There were other athletes, too, who are highly qualified, but on paper didn't have the experience, you know, that um, that perspective employers or even people from the outside are looking at. <laughs> No, that's good. That's good. Um, while you were talking and I, I was thinking more along the lines of having to prove yourself, because as a woman, I feel like that's something that either we feel like we have to do to justify why we want something or people demand that we prove or provide more to justify but sometimes not even know that there is a microaggression there. <laughs> so when you were in the midst of this, and I know there is like possibly some conflict of interest, but then that was put to bed because there was a recusal. recusal. Um, you applied, you went through the, the exact same process, just like everybody else would, any other type of interviewee. So what do you think was happening? What do you think was at play that made you feel like or required you to have to keep trying to prove that you belonged in that space? You know, I really, I, it goes with two things, you know, you think about being a female, I think that's definitely one, you know, that I, I had to go back to that. But, but secondly was my age. And I feel that, you know, at times I, I did feel discriminated against, you know, just because I was the young person and people, you know, saying, well, well, you need more time in the classroom. And it's like, what's more time in the classroom going to, to do me if I already have the skill set? You know, it's like and when you're ready, you're ready. You know, I think it's one of those things like there are some teachers who, yes, they spend 20 
plus years in the classroom. And then they say, okay, I think I'm ready to be an administrator now where the rule is it's, you know, five years in the classroom and then you you're able to move out and do that. And so I think for me, I had to continue to prove that just because there, there were those naysayers, but it, it came to a point where I was finally content with it. And I think what really helped me with that was the support from my staff and my students in the community. Like they, they totally had my back. And it was one of those things where, yes, there's a new person. Like I had to prove myself, but I think after that first year, they really saw who I was about. And when I left that position, that's when it really hit me that what an impact I made in such a, a small amount of time. You know, I still get calls and texts and, you know, messages from the community there, like how much they miss me. But I, I left knowing that I made an impact and I, I definitely left that school better than the way that I found, found it. And, you know, I want to make sure that no matter what transition you're in in life, and this is, you know, going back to just like family values, like I always go in looking and seeing what can I do to leave this place better than the way I found it so that it's almost like passing that baton off, right? And that was, that was my goal for the next principal. Like, you know, here's what I did. Here's the baton. Keep going, you know, and, and, and that's really what it's about. It's not about one individual person. It's about what we can do as a collective unit to really move our society and especially our future with kids, you know, forward. I love that. It reminds me of something I saw a little while ago, document, documentary, um, can't remember the name of it, but they were talking to um, different people around the world who were making major impacts. And this one young guy came up with a way um, to create more sustainability. And I think don't, I might be wrong, but I think he was probably in Nigeria somewhere. So every time he cut down or someone cut down a tree, you had to plant two more trees and it just created more stability, sustainability in the, in the country. And I can't go into all the scientific things and all of that, but what you just said reminded me of that. A lot of times I think we concentrate more on what we can get out of a situation instead of thinking about the seeds that we can also plant. So when you take from a place, um, you have to also think of what is the condition that this will that this place will be in when I leave with all the things that I've taken. So now what can I do as an as a person, individual, expert, whatever you call yourself, to reinvest whatever that may look like into this environment, into this community, so that there is a better impact that it, it look, it may not look completely different, but the feeling, you know, um, the way other people have been able to transform their lives, for instance, the way that the kids felt back when you were there, it's different. And you can start seeing those seeds sprout. And I can tell you, I remember my best teachers. So <laughs> if people are calling you and saying different things, I'm telling you, you may not hear from certain kids for, for like forever and to the future, but I'm pretty, pretty sure that you've, you did absolutely make an amazing impact on them. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you for that. <laughs> you are welcome. Um, so guys, I have a little announcement for you really quick before we move forward. Um, if you are watching this now or if you are listening to this at a later date, we have a new course that is launching. So are you an athlete, an athlete in business, or professional helping athletes? I want you to join the Athletes Making Moves course that is launching this month, March 21st, 2022, to help athletes find and reshape their identity, understand business and its building blocks, and begin creating and implementing legacy. A portion of the proceeds are being donated to the Alzheimer's Association in the honor of my late grandmother, Glovine Smith, as a token and appreciation of her love and investment into my life. So if you are interested in understanding business, removing all of the mindset blocks that are keeping you from building um, a protectable business, then I want to have you in this course. You can go to bit.ly forward slash AMM course. If you're listening to this, 
It is bit.ly forward slash capital A-M-M capital C and then lowercase O-U-R-S-E. All right, so now we're going to do something fun, Dr. Lepe. I think that's why, how I'm going to keep pronouncing it. <laughs> it's, it's actually more fun that way. <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to go into the fast boxing round because I want you to think fast on your feet. Um, the first question is going to ask you about an athlete in business. It's going to ask you, I'm also going to ask you about another athlete in your family. So it cannot be you. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> if you could have dinner with one person, who would it be? Oh, man. Um, I'm not really good at this already. Okay. <laughs> I would say the person would be Ken Revisa, my sports psychologist that I had at Fullerton. Um, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago um, before I really got into this work. And I would give anything right now to have dinner with him to sit down and just talk about all those seeds that he planted. Um, one in particular is be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's like something I live by each and every day. So if I could go back. <laughs> yes. <would> be him. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. And I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, if you could do anything and not fail, what would it be? <sighs> Skydive. <laughs> I almost had you spit out your coffee. Girl, you gotta no, it's water in here, but you definitely almost had this it. water. <laughs> I think my husband put that on his bucket list to skydive. I don't know, y'all. I'm a little nervous about that one. All right. So name an athlete in your family in their sport. Oh, it has to be my aunt Pam, who I talked about earlier. Yes, she right. played college basketball at Cal State Northridge back in the day. Okay, you did say that. Name one athlete in business that you wish you knew personally. Mm, okay, I'm going to go back. I mean, these are people I wish I would have met beforehand, but it would have been Kobe Bryant for sure. Um, you know, and, and I think more so not not just what he was able to do the time that he was an athlete, but afterwards. I mean, he really took his transition well. <laughs> yeah, no, he did. He did. And, you know, <clears throat> I, I really hope that um, – as a community, like we don't think of those kind of athletes as anomalies because we actually can do the same things, right? It's whether we believe that we can do it or not. Um, but yeah, I feel you on that. And sometimes to do it, you just need to be in the same room to connect. Yeah. So here's my next question for you, because we are in Women's History Month. This is the month of March, even if you guys are listening to this like a year from now. Uh, <laughs> so here's my question for you. Name one woman that has inspired or impacted you in some way, shape or form that you don't even know. And if you could meet them, what would be the first thing you would say? <sighs> I would say, honestly, I know there's like, there's so many, but I go back to even as a younger girl and it was honestly, it was Oprah Winfrey. Like I still, I still remember going over to my grandma's house and watching her show, like, you know, after school and that type of stuff. But she, she always had a great message and everything was, it wasn't about her. It was always about uplifting others. Um, and, and one of the books that I read of hers um, as I was transitioning away from my, my job as a principal into this now was um, The Path Made Clear. And I don't know if you've ever read that book, but it's amazing. Um, the audiobook is even better because she actually has the interviews that she did with guests like um, embedded in it. But she just has a way of bringing people together and uplifting no matter what is going on in the world. You know, you can always count on her to be there and to find the beauty, even when that seems to be darkness. Like even during COVID-19, she had a whole series on, on Apple plus, you know, really just honing in on, on the goodness of things that were happening. Yeah. So that's a I, good one. Yeah, I would I would have dinner with her too. <laughs> and she doesn't live that far from me either. She lives here in California in Montecito, so I got to make it happen. <laughs> I'm for look, call me in. Okay? Got oh you, my girl. gosh, that is like a great one. I actually listed her in an article 
um, that I was featured in, someone that I would love to have dinner with. When I think of, of course, she's this huge mogul now, right? But Oprah is still human. She suffered some major life crisis in her younger days. Um, things that if you haven't gone through yourself, like, do you think you would have survived that? You know, even when she got into entertainment, I remember her talking about this. She dealt with discrimination back in those days. I mean, to be a black woman as an anchor was almost unheard of, (laughs) you know? So, I mean, she's really, she's dealt with a lot of different things, personal things, abuse, um, you know, discrimination in the works, workplace, uh, feeling marginalized and disrespected and unappreciated, like a lot of women do these days. So I am so glad that you brought her up because she's a, she's a great person to recognize that the success you want is absolutely possible for you. It doesn't have to look like anybody else's. It is absolutely possible for you. So we're going to transition. And this is going to be my last group of questions for you. So, you know, I am a lawyer. Okay. Sound like, you know what? What is that commercial with Howie? Is it Howie the one that um, that owns? Oh, my gosh. The What, are the, what do you call the people that... Um, run behind celebrities and stuff to take photos. Uh, paparazzi. Paparazzi, yeah. I don't know why I can remember that. <laughs> yeah. Is the guy named Howie that owns what is the name? Um, I think it starts with a T, but I can't even recall it right now. But anyway, part of his whoever this guy is, part of his little commercial says, I am a lawyer, but he's not even a lawyer. So anyway, that's kind of where I was going with that, but the joke was so bad because I couldn't remember anything. So... <laughs> So as an attorney, my goal is to make sure that people reorient their ideals and minds around the law because there are ways that it can help us, where it can support us. But if we only have a negative connotation about it, we'll be completely turned off from it. So this section is brought to you guys by my law firm, the SL DeBrawls Law Firm. If you are a business owner or entrepreneur with a service product, Um, with a service or a product and you desire to build a lasting legacy or an impact, I want you to make sure you reach out to me. Um, You can reach out to me at sldebrows.com so that we can help you increase your bottom line by boosting your business protection, which is absolutely important. And we also, like I said, we want to change your mindset on the law because it can work for you and help you to actually keep your money, (laughs) not get into a place where you're going to be caught up in liability. Um, so Dr. Lepe, here's my question for you. Um, and it's, you can, you can go fast with it if you want to, it's at your own speed. So, but I do want you to think about it. So what is one thing that you love about the law? Um, I love that there is a law, <laughs> number one. Um, but I, I'd say probably because it, although I, even for myself, you know, I'm knowledgeable about some things about the law and there's a whole lot that I don't know, but I know that it's there to protect us, you know, and it's about having that systems and structure. Like even when I was classroom teacher, we had a set of rules, you know, I have principal, same thing. It provides that structure and that level of safety for people so that, you know, things can happen the way they need to happen by having some type of structure. So that's what I love about it. I do love systems and structure. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) Look, it it reminds me of like trying to follow a map. I can't follow a map for anything, but if you give me the directions, I'm there. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) All right. So now the polar opposite. What do you either highly dislike about the law or what scares you about the law? 
I think like with anything, what I don't know. <laughs> and that that can be that can be scary because you don't know if you're breaking a law. You know, there could be some like fine line type stuff. Like, of course, there's the obvious, you know, sets of rules and, you know, especially like for driving and things like that that we're aware of. But, you know, sometimes even you get pulled over for something where maybe you didn't realize, you know, you were breaking a law or whatever it was. Yeah. So that's that's what scares me. What I don't know. <laughs> that's good. Because I didn't even think about that piece, but that is that is really, really good. Um, OK, so now what are three things that you wish you'd known about the law? <laughs> oh, man. OK, so first one starts with um, when I was 18. Um, I didn't know that jaywalking was actually a thing. So that was my first ticket. <laughs> I was in, in Santa Barbara for uh, one of my friend's 18th birthdays, and we were walking around uh, on State Street, and all of us decided to cross the street. There was, like, you know, a weird person that was kind of walking behind us, and we're like, you know what, let's just cross the street now. And we crossed right in front of a motorcycle cop, and there was about eight of us, and he literally sat there and wrote tickets for all eight of us, even though we tried to let him know that there was, you know, an individual that was behind us that we were a little suspicious about. He found it hard to believe because there were a couple of tall guys in our group because they were volleyball players, too. And so, yeah. Anyways, oh, he, that was he my met first. That quota. He met that quota that day. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's one. Um, second would be, I would say when my grandparents had passed away, um, just knowing that it's so important to have like a living trust. Um, and I'm really grateful that my parent or my grandparents did set that up so that although that time is challenging in itself, it really does give you once again, that systems and structure, that set of rules so that, you know, this is what their wishes were. And this is our responsibility, you know, to follow through with that. So yeah, it's a, a whole component. And so um, planning ahead, I think, is the lesson to be learned out of that. And then let's see, third thing I wish I knew about the law. Um, I wish I knew more. Honestly, I think that's really what it comes down to, you know, as far as e even within my business, you know, things that I could be doing or that I should be doing that I'm not aware of. Um, Cause a lot of times we, we put those things off, right. Until it's like a situation happens or you did something wrong, then you learn the hard way. So I, I think having more of a proactive approach, especially when it comes to business is definitely something I wish I knew more about. Man, those were good, 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 good. And when you started talking about your grandparents, so I just wrapped up a two day workshop on legacy so three methods to creating a legacy by increasing protection and the first day we focused just on what do you even want your legacy to be right and then the second day we worked on what are what are all of the ways well what are all of the things that you probably have that are assets that you're not even paying attention to and then what are the ways that you can start to protect them so now that you know this because most people won't think and don't think about um their legacy and what will happen after their death, they don't put anything in place. And a lot of folks, some people, I think they're probably scared too, to think, okay, if I start thinking about, if I start thinking about um, my death, like, am I going to die <laughs> tomorrow? Like it really, really scares people, but it's something that has to be done, especially when you are creating something that is so amazing. Because sometimes folks, I mean, what if your let's 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 say if it's not your grandparents, let's say let's say it's someone close to you. You have siblings. Okay. So let's say if one of your siblings passed away. Oh, and for you guys listening, she did say yes, but she is on mute. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> That's okay. Look, I'm, I'm trying to remember, like, to go back and say certain things almost as if I'm in front of a court reporter. So if somebody's in court and they are waving their arms around, um, court, please let the court reporter note that, you know, deponent or defendant is waving their hands. <laughs> I love it. That's that experience you got. <laughs> Girl, yes. But um, so what I was going to say is, let's just say, it's one of your one of your siblings passed, God forbid, but one of them passed. Maybe there were some people that they didn't really jive with in their family, but they didn't have any kids. Well, now you if, if they did not have a trust directing 
their property to someone, if they did not have a will that clearly identified and stated unequivocally who gets what, well, their property could be distributed to people who they don't want to have a benefit in their estate, right? So when you die without a will, when you die without um, a trust being implemented, the state has to distribute your assets, what they call as per strippies. And that is just basically who would be considered the immediate heirs at law at the time of your death. So if you were an older individual, um, even if you had kids, but your kids predeceased you and they didn't have any children, and maybe you didn't have siblings, well, then your next heirs at law could be your aunts and uncles if your parents have also predeceased, predeceased you. Um, it could be cousins that you haven't even talked to in forever. <laughs> or even seen and think about what you've created and the value of what you've created. Right. And so right. planning right now puts those things into the driver's seat for you. And I'm going to give you guys a little tip of the information I found and shared 70% of legacies fail at the time of death. And it's failing because of a number of reasons. People aren't properly communicating and educating their children on their estates and what they want their legacies to be. Um, people are, or think that their children aren't ready to receive wealth, which is so counterintuitive because you don't talk to them about the money and what the wealth is because you feel like they're not ready. So when you pass away, they're still not ready. And then what ends up happening? A whole bunch of things could happen. They could lose the, the wealth to business issues, litigation issues, taxes for lack of maintaining, you know, property taxes, what, whatever, um, so yeah, this is a conversation. I'm just so glad that you brought this up because this is something that I feel like we all should be thinking about. And especially, I mean, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't wait until you have a child to think about your legacy, but especially if you do have kids, this is the time to start thinking about your legacy and not be short-sighted with it. Don't think about it in terms of just the line of your kids you need to start thinking far out. How do you want your legacy to be in, to impact your family generations from now? Because then that will help you plan better around who should get what, what is supposed to happen, conditions. Are there conditions that you want to put on to receive certain benefits from you? Um, and in what vehicle would you be utilizing or protecting those assets? Is it just through a will? Is it through trust? And there's so many different types of trusts and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, so if you guys want access to the legacy training, um, comment on this video. I will send you a link to register to get access to that. And we'll go from there. Um, Dr. Lepe, is there any Lepe? Hey, hey. <laughs> Look, that is me at home all day. I'll like create songs out of nothing. But is there any parting words, advice. Um, you know what? Hold on. Let's wind this back because I didn't really talk about your book. I want you to talk about this book really quick before we go. You created an amazing book, Pivoting from the Game. Can you tell us what prompted you to write this um, and who would it benefit and where can they get it? Absolutely. Thank you for that. So yes, I, I did write a book, uh, Pivoting from the Game, and it's specifically named Pivoting instead of Pivot, because there's going to be more than one time in your life where you're going to go back to that book and really take in what's, what's there to help you transition to the next phase. And so this book is exactly what I wish I would have had, the advice I would have had as I transitioned away from college athletics and tried to figure out what's next. Um, it's essentially what I teach within my coaching program, which is a rebranded athlete game plan where we tap into your potential. So the skill set you already come with as an athlete, your purpose, finding out who you are without your sport and what you're meant to do here on this earth. And I think what a lot of athletes get caught up in is that their time as an athlete was the best years, you know, or, and, and it's really just a small, small percentage of your entire life. And so figuring out what else you're here to do, I think is really something that requires some inner work. Um, and you may have to do that more than once in your life, you know, because what you thought is your purpose could be something else. And so that's where that transition piece comes in. And then coming up with a plan. So path, you know, creating a path for that. And then also um, 
taking off with it and pursuing it. And so it's one thing to have a plan, but to actually take action on it so that you get to your destination of where you want to go. That's what this book is all about. So it's a little bit of my story intertwined in there mixed in with um, some golden nuggets, as I call them, that I wish I would have had along along the way. And there's also a chance for you to do some reflection. It's an interactive book and um, it's available on rebrandedathlete.com. There's a link on there for books. Um, I also have a podcast as well, too, that Savanya has been on as well. So you guys will also have to check out that episode. And I'm also, um, you know, working with college athletes and professional athletes as they transition away from life after sports, life in into life after sports and really figuring out what's next. So if anything that I said today resonated with you or if you have any questions about the process, you can reach me here on LinkedIn at uh, slepe under rebranded athlete. And then also on Instagram, that's where I do a lot of my content at rebranded athlete. And every Wednesday night I go live um, talking about life after sports with Josh Copeland. And we go on there and really just have conversations. We reminisce a little bit about what our transition was like and provide value for you guys moving forward. So I would love to connect with you guys as well. Yes. And your podcast is amazing, guys. So make sure you go and check that out for sure. Rebranded Athlete. And you know what? I'm going to have to reach out to some of the athletes in our community because a lot of us have books. And I think it'll be an amazing idea to create this packaging of books made specifically for athletes, especially athletes transitioning, athletes in business, athletes who are creating brands, all different types of things. So don't nobody steal my idea, okay? <laughs> I love that. That's a great idea. <laughs> Let me know how I can help. <laughs> yes, by putting your book into the fold. <laughs> but this is so awesome. Guys, make sure you get a copy of this book, Pivoting from the Game. Um, <clears throat> I know that if you are a person who's struggling with finding out or recognizing who you are, your greatness outside of sports, um, someone who may be struggling and trying to figure out what it, what else is there to do for me. This is a great book for you. You've had an opportunity. I mean, wind this thing all the way back if you need to hear through some of the things that Dr. Lepe went through um, to get to where she is today. And she's not saying that it's going to be easy, but there are things that you can do for yourself right now. And part of that is just knowing that you are worth every bit and every second of the effort that you put into getting where you want to be. Okay. So go get that book, Pivoting from the Game. Dr. Lepe, it was such a pleasure to talk to you today. I mean, you gave me so many nuggets to help me also reevaluate some things. And as you were speaking, especially about um, the bartender job, I started thinking about some of the past experiences I had and it was like, whoa, I actually, I kind of learned some stuff from that too. Cause like just seeing some of the similarities between what you went through, some things that I've gone through. Um, and that's another thing too. When, when we really listen to people's story, we see the humanization piece of it. Um, and it removes that, that idea that um, this can't work for me for whatever reason, right? Um, because I think sometimes we put people on a pedestal that really they're not on, they're just working. They're working their butts off to get the results that they want. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. You've enriched my life today for sure. Guys, what you're going to say? Uh, I was just going to say, thank you so much. No. You know, I, <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I had a great time coming on here and sharing my story. And, you know, it's inspiring to be in another room with, you know, another female athlete, you know, um, doing some great things and helping out the the future of athletes. And, Last thing, you know, I just want to say is, you know, athletes have the ability to change the world. So whatever you guys are going to do next in this next season of your life, it is not the end that, um, you know, sports is over. And that's the concept of a rebranded athlete. You're going to carry the life lessons, the skills that you've had during your time as an athlete and rebrand it into this next phase, this next season of your life. So thank you so much for having me on today. You are welcome. And you're so, 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 so right. Um, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. If you have not yet gone to subscribe to What Are You Sporting About podcast, I urge you right now, go on your favorite po podcast platform because it's everywhere. Like I promise you, it's everywhere. We've recently gotten on uh, iHeartRadio. So please go there, show us some love. 
Um, make sure you you sign up to receive every episode that comes out so you never miss anything. And we're going to continue bringing great people to you who will impact you and educate you to your very next level. I'm your host, Amalia DeBarros, protector of athletes. Until next time, I'll check you guys later. Ciao. <laughs> For joining us this week on What Are You Sporting About podcast, make sure to visit our website, prosportlawyer.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite platform is so you'll never miss a show. And while you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, What Are You Sporting About? Attorney Savania DeBarros is available for private consulting at S ldebarros.com. And remember, we're here to educate, support, and guide you in your journey to success because we're all sporting about something.